Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first virtual Donor Connect event of our um, time together. Uh, our event today is called Inspire Resilience Across Our Community. My name is Sarah Reichert. I am the Director of Donor Relations for the Community Foundation. I am very lucky to work with uh, several of you. Um, during this unique time, we continue to assist donors in charitable giving and as well as connecting donors to causes that you care about especially through events like Donor Connect. Traditionally, we have these in person and we have pivoted during this time to hold them virtually. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing the Community Foundation of Greater Des Moines board chair, Dr. Deming. Dr. Deming is such a light in our community and we're so grateful that we've, he has a few minutes to join us today. Dr. Deming, take it away. Great, thank you, Sarah. Um, it's great to be with you. It's such an honor to serve as the board chair and I am so proud of everything that the Community Foundation has been doing, especially this year as they uh, helped uh, the community uh, get going with the um, uh, Donor Relief Fund and all of the important work that they're doing uh, related to uh, the vulnerable populations and even putting this uh, talk together and talking about resilience. Those of us that are uh, serving in essential roles um, know that uh, we're being supported and comforted and, uh, and um, really elevated by the community. Um, but there is a toll that is paid for being on the front line and there are so many people, not just the medical community, but our uh, service workers, our uh, food workers, our grocery stores, our delivery people. And um, even though we often are able to muster our best faces and put our best foot forward, there is a toll. And to be able to talk about resiliency and what we can do to continue to be positive. I want to share just a story that um, came to me through uh, the Charter for Compassion, and it really puts into perspective the work that we're doing today. It's a story about anthropologist Margaret Mead. She was once asked by a student what she considered to be the first sign of civilization in a culture. The student expected Mead to talk about fish hooks or clay pots or grinding stones, but no, Margaret Mead said that the first sign of civilization in an ancient culture was a femur that had been broken and then healed. Mead went on to explain that in the animal kingdom, if you break your femur, you die. You cannot run from danger. You can't get to the river for a drink or hunt for food. You are meat for prowling beasts. No animal survives a broken femur long enough for the bone to heal. A broken femur that has healed is evidence that someone has taken the time to be with the one who fell, has bound up the wound, has carried the person to safety, has tended to the person through recovery. Helping someone else through difficulty is where civilization starts. We are at our best when we serve others. And we are all right now given that opportunity to just serve others and um, I just want to thank all the staff of the Community Foundation for the work that you're doing to serve others and to elevate the work that's being done throughout the community. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Can you hear me? Shake heads. Okay, thank you. I'm Christy Naus, President of the Community Foundation. Thank you, Dr. Deming. Your reflections are always so grounding to us and I think set the stage well for our discussion about resilience um, today. As Sarah and Dr. Deming have shared, thank you. Um, thank you for your ongoing support of our community and for your continued partnership with the Community Foundation. At the Community Foundation of Greater Des Moines, you will hear a couple of phrases frequently. And one is, it's a marathon not a sprint. It is not at all unusual for us to work with donors individually or with their families over a period of many years before we see a gift plan or legacy plan come to fruition. So we're used to that marathon mentality. Lately though, we have been at a full throttle sprint in our community. Our community leaders have been running on adrenaline to see our businesses, our nonprofit organizations, and our community through the transition from the normal to the abnormal. Now it's the time to prepare and build the endurance we need for the marathon to come, the marathon to rebuild the community we love. 
During the time I've been navigating the COVID pandemic, I've changed my morning wake up reflection from, is this really happening? To what can I do to use my influence to inspire resilience in this community, um, at the community foundation, within my family? And resilience is exactly what we're gonna focus on today. So I'd like to welcome our panel, acknowledging that they have been sprinting at full speed and we are so grateful they're taking a water break to be with us today. So we are so honored to have Elizabeth Buck, who's the United Way of Central Iowa president and serves as the chair for human capital work of Capital Crossroads Plan, our vision plan for Greater Des Moines. Elizabeth and her team quickly expanded and deployed the 211 call system as a lifeline to our community throughout the pandemic. Elizabeth has her finger on the pulse of the ebbs and flows of the needs of the most vulnerable in our community and we're so grateful for her leadership and efforts, which will be hugely necessary as we look forward to recovery. Jay Byers is the Greater Des Moines Partnership CEO and serves as a tri-chair for Capital Crossroads. Jay and his team at the partnership have led efforts to keep our community informed of the effects of the COVID pandemic on our economic development, workforce, and business community, and will be key to our community's rebuilding. Angela Conley serves on the Polk County Board of Supervisors and has since 1998, and she serves as a tri-chair for Capital Crossroads as well. Angela has worked tirelessly to address the so many, very, very many issues resulting from the pandemic, dealing with everything from emergency coordination, healthcare coordination, issues with social distancing and homelessness, food provision, and the list goes on and on. And finally, Sally Dix is the Executive Director of Bravo Greater Des Moines and serves as the Chair of the Cultural Capital Element of Capital Crossroads. Bravo serves as our Regional Arts and Arts Council and provides critical operational funding to our region's arts and culture organizations. Sally and Bravo will be instrumental in helping our arts and culture organizations survive the pandemic and thrive once again as we recover. So friends, Thank you for being here today. We're grateful for your time and all you're doing to help us look toward resiliency for the community we love. But first, let's set the stage and part of looking to the future is understanding where we're at. Could each of you give your perspective on the current status of your sector as a result of COVID? And you know what, we'll go ahead and Elizabeth, We'll go ahead and start with you. Thank you. Oh, hopefully you can hear me. So um, obviously the nonprofit sector has been greatly impacted and we've been looking at some research that's been done by the Iowa Department of Economic Development. And the early results show that about 92% of um, nonprofits in central Iowa have been negatively impacted by this pandemic. Um, what's been interesting about this is because the nonprofit sector is so broad and we um, are seen in so many different spaces, it's um, the impact, the areas of impact have been um, different. But one that all of them are experiencing is really a change in the business operations. So depending on if they're connected to a school or if they're running a dental clinic or um, a, non, a nonprofit child care center, their operation base and needs have really greatly changed. And that's um, been traumatic and impactful to them. Also, we're seeing about 50% of our nonprofits are seeing an increased um, service level, but they also don't have the security of knowing where that increased funding will get, come from yet. So they're offering services, they're, they're reaching out, um, doing what they need to do, but they still don't have um, that security of knowing where their funding is coming from. And mm -hmm. examples of that are food pantries, legal aid, folks who are helping our New Iowans, refugees and immigrants, um, uh, homeless shelters, a lot of different places in our community are seeing um, record setting demands for their services. And then the other one that is just uh, shared by all of our nonprofits is really fundraising concerns. So many of their spring fundraising events have been canceled, grant funding has been reduced, um, so they're just feeling a lot of insecurity and not knowing when we'll get back to a new normal and what that will look like for them. And in our community, we have more than a third of our nonprofits have five or less staff members. So we're dealing with a lot of small nonprofits that are the ones that are going to be um, really key to our recovery. 
if you think about the folks who are being um, affected, laid off, um, struggling right now, those um, individuals are going to be looking to our nonprofit sector to help them to recover. So the strength of this sector is really important. Um, I think the other thing that we've learned um, is that many of our nonprofits don't even have 90 days worth of funding um, in reserve. Um, and so that has been um, added stress for them and something that we, we've been seeing, seeing acting out in terms of just uh, the resiliency of our nonprofit sector right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think many of our, um, many of us um, through our funding have given, um, and I know Bravo has done the same as United Way, have given our nonprofits the grace to use um, the funding that we have with them, the partnership that we have with them to, to use, use their funds in a way that's most helpful to them uh, to really help them with their recovery. So that's one of the ways that United Way has really been helping to support our nonprofit sector also working to bring our nonprofits together to really talk and, and share best practices and figure out ways to collaborate in a new and different way. So that's a little bit about the nonprofit sector. Thank you. Actually, I'm going to shift to you, Sally, because you work so closely with nonprofits and um, representing the arts and culture um, element of our community. Do you mind? Yeah, no, just um, would echo everything Elizabeth said. I think it's really important that, um, particularly from the arts perspective, people think of our nonprofits as contributing to our quality of life, which they absolutely do. And they provide essential inspiration and creativity and the opportunity for us to explore culture as a community. I just don't want everyone to miss that they are also a substantial economic engine for our region. And I know for the arts and cultural sector, our last economic impact study demonstrated that the nonprofit cultural organizations have $185 million annual economic impact on our region. So just making sure to pivot off of what Elizabeth said, they are all being hit hard, but they are all going to be essential to bringing us back online and getting the engine moving again. Mm -hmm. uh, specific to the cultural sector, the economic impact has been a combination of the contributed revenue, as Elizabeth said, grants changing and uh, sponsorships not coming in as, as the philanthropic the philanthropic community kind of pauses to see what the needs are. Mm -hmm. um, the cultural organizations are also uniquely hit by the loss of the earned revenue. Um, spring is often a really busy time for school field trips, for membership sales, for fundraising events, um, summer camp sales, everyone thinking about coming into summer. So our, our nonprofit cultural organizations are struggling on, on both fronts and certainly that future revenue piece too. When will people come back? When will they feel comfortable? comfortable sitting in a theater or enjoying live music together. So there are a lot of impacts. Um, the positive to end on a little bit of an up note for the cultural sector is that uh, this group is maybe uniquely positioned to find the silver lining, right? Their content naturally translates to a digital environment in some ways, and they're able to put out some amazing, creative, mm -hmm. thought-provoking artistic experiences for our community. Um, it's going to be both an asset and a challenge in the long term because they haven't monetized it. It's a great social benefit right now, but they do need to figure out how to make their money on it, uh, on it moving forward. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I heard I was on a webinar last week uh, nationally with other community foundations and they were talking about the nonprofit sector as an economic driver and just reminded us that being a nonprofit is a tax status, not a business plan. And so as even we're seeing the support come down through loan opportunities for small businesses, et cetera, we need to make sure that our nonprofit sector is represented in that. All right, let's move on to you, Angela, if you don't mind, and then we'll um, finish off with Jay in the business sector. You've been working, on, your fingers have been all over this community, Angela, so I know you've got a lot to share. Well, as a local government, there's, you know, such essential services that we, that we have to provide and, and have to keep open um, for our economy and all the communities that we serve, and we have to keep running, so we had to work extremely hard to identify what those services were and uh, how, how to produ provide them in a manner that is safe for our employees and our citizens. So that includes our jail, you know, people still need to uh, title their cars, they still wanna purchase homes to get their titles. And most importantly, we wanna continue to provide food in our community, not only to the food banks and uh, DMARC, but our, 
uh, most valuable um, services to our seniors. We have all the community centers throughout Polk County, so we continue to do that. We had to find a unique way to do that. So we have a drive up service to all of our community services for the elderly. And it's amazing to me that 95 to 150 every single day, they come and pick up their meal. So we knew that was an essential service and we continue to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're happy to provide that service throughout the community. Uh, you know, we've been providing this community's response to COVID really since January. We started working on this response with the Polk County Health Department and emergency management. We've been convening with our partners to start planning this community response. So we started working with our local hospitals, our long-term care facilities, first responders, and a lot of community efforts went into that. Uh, so we've really been on the front line with this response. And one of our large funder, as a large funder, we really had to take a close look on how we're gonna spend our dollars. And unfortunately for now, we've suspended, and I know Elizabeth and uh, Sally has mentioned this, our grants, we really have taken a pause on this, on our community grants right now because we need to focus on COVID-19. I'm hoping that we get to put that back in, but we really need to respond on our basic needs such as food and shelter. And that's what our responsibility is right now. So I'm sure that we will be continuing to go full steam ahead when we, when we have the green light to do that. But right now we've really taken a pause on all of our grants. And I know that concerns a lot of our nonprofits, but, um, I think that was the right thing to do right now. You know, we've got a, I'm really proud of our emergency management team. We've got a medical coordination center at the emergency management or at the emergency operations center that has been a tremendous success. We just had to do things differently to look at all the basic needs in our community. And uh, they've really stepped up to the plate because, you know, we're working from scratch here. Nobody's ever faced this before. Mm -hmm. And we've had to do, uh, things from ground zero and we've really, I think, done an outstanding job so far. Uh, we've got a long ways to go. I'm really, really nervous about the nonprofits and um, how we move forward on all of that, getting them back into the uh, economy and trying to figure all of this out. But I know together as a community, we're going to get that done because that's what Absolutely. we do. We're stronger yeah. together and I know we're going to make that happen. Thank you, Angela. Absolutely right. Jay? Let's open your mic. I'm anxious to hear what you've got to say about economic development in the business sector, what you're seeing. Thanks, Christy, uh, for including us in this discussion. Really appreciate it. Thanks for everybody for taking time um, to uh, um, be part of this today. And, and I know there's a lot of people, um, in addition to those of us who are presenting today, they're doing extraordinary things. So thanks to everybody who's part of this today and all the great things that you guys have been doing over the past six weeks. It's, uh, um, I've said this multiple times the last couple of weeks, but I've never been more proud to be an Iowan and, and to be from Des Moines to just to see the amazing work that's done and people coming together to do things that we never thought we'd have to do without a playbook. So thanks to everybody for that. Um, so Greater Des Moines Partnership, um, we um, immediate, immediately shifted our um, resources and focus to really three um, primary um, three primary themes, and, and those are what can we do to um, help keep businesses in business, what can we do to help keep people working, and what can we do to help uh, keep the community safe. And that's really what we redesigned um, our entire strategic plan, put together a short-term uh, four to eight-week strategic plan um, within all of our uh, work platforms, and that's really what we've been focusing on uh, with a laser focus. And um, so part of that is, you know, we're pretty event-heavy, do a lot of events, so we quickly decided um, what should we do in terms of um, if, if we had an event on the books, could we make it virtual? We made it virtual. If not, could we move it? If then not, um, we canceled it. And that's, we did that immediately. But since, uh, since the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has broke, we have um, hosted more than 40 um, webinars. We put out a ton of other content with um, blogs, um, with podcasts. We're doing um, regular emails and, and really tr trying to provide um, accurate, um, up-to-date information um, we put together a COVID-19 rapid response hub. We think it's one of the best ones in the country and hopefully um, a number of you have been utilizing that, but we're constantly updating that with updated and, and um, relevant, accurate information. Um, and then also just trying to do our part to tell these uh, important stories through our DSM Strong initiative with all those great stories of hope and optimism and all the great things that the Community Foundation and Bravo and the county and United Way and, and so many of you on the calls have been doing and how can we highlight those um, great stories and provide that inspiration for others. 
Um, and that's a big part of what we all need to do as well too, moving forward. Um, in terms of some of the specific things we've been doing within our work platforms, um, in no specific order, I'll start with our small business work. Um, this is a huge, um, a huge issue out there. Small businesses, um, especially in certain industries, restaurants and others have just been getting crushed and we know that. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been um, working very, very closely with our um, uh, pub public policy leaders, whether that's in Congress, um, governor's office to really relay those concerns to our policymakers and then to um, get that information out to all of our members as quickly as possible in terms of the programming that's been available, whether that's the PPP, the SBA loans or the IEDA um, grants and, 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 and really encouraging all of our members um, to apply for those and, and to assist as, as needed. Um, we also launched with Catch Des Moines, um, the DSM local challenge um, to really encourage um, folks to support local businesses and do that on social media and challenge other people to do that. We've had somewhere in the neighborhood of like 32 million impressions on that campaign. So we're excited about um, the, um, what we've been able to do to encourage people to, again, buy local um, and, and to support those businesses that most need it right now. Um, also, um, we are working on a um, small business loan or a small business grant program that we'll be rolling out on Monday. Um, public private um, that really is focused on um, filling some gaps that of, of those um, small businesses of sole proprietors through um, 20, uh, 25 employees that uh, fell out of the or that, that fell through the gaps of either the PPP program um, or the um, state's uh, um, economic development grant program and so that we've been spending a lot of time working on that with our public partners and and um, and we'll be rolling that out on Monday as well. Um, on the talent front, it's a big part of what we do, recruit talent, um, retain talent, and skill up existing talent. Um, we went from a period of um, nobody could find workers, um, almost full employment, um, to now um, significant unemployment rates. Um, and so uh, one of the things that we've done with our DSM Employment Ready Initiative, with our um, online resources that we already had with our Career Hub is really to highlight those businesses who are currently looking to hire people and connecting um, those with those who are now uh, unemployed and looking for work. And to, again, part of our strategy to keep as many people working as we can as possible. We've rolled out a number of other initiatives on that front as well um, in terms of podcasts and so forth with Palmer Group and others to uh, provide those resources to those looking for work right now. And then we've also worked very closely with the um, Des Moines Public Schools in, in helping devise that strategy to get um, uh, families hooked up um, to uh, having that internet service and the hardware. Um, you've been reading about that, but there's a ton of work behind the scenes that's been done on that, working with Mediacom and others, and we've been working on that behind the scenes and really important work, um, very difficult work. Um, in terms of economic development, we've modified our strategies. It's a big part of what we do, just in terms of our business retention and expansion and prospecting, and we've developed vir uh, virtual strategies for all of that. Um, and then for, for downtown, um, specifically, um, Operation Downtown has had a laser focus on um, disinfecting downtown and trying to keep it safe and clean, much more so than we had done in the past. But that's been a big part of that focus. And then how do we sort of transition events? Um, this week, we've spent a lot of times in terms of what does a farmer's market look like. Um, there's an announcement going out today in terms of what we're going to be doing at least the first few weeks with the virtual farmer's market. I'm not sure if that's hit the wire yet or not, but it's coming quickly. Um, but just managing to, through some of those announcements um, that, were, that were made with the governor this past week in terms of what a limited market could look like. That's, you're not going to see that um, at least for a few weeks, but we're looking at what that could look like. Um, but we're still looking at the Arts Festival and um, all these other events too, in terms of how do we, how, um, what do those look like? So that's been just a quick snapshot of what our world has looked like. Um, we're moving from this really short term, almost triage strategy to now spending a lot of time um, focusing on this long term, uh, mid term and long term recovery. So we're spending a lot of time uh, behind the scenes developing what that can look like for the region in that framework. So that's what you're going to be seeing come out of us probably in the next uh, week or so. Thank you, Jay. So when I say sprint, as you can see, um, I was not joking around. Uh, we're going to move uh, on and pivot to resilience a little bit and looking forward. And as we do that in our next question, please feel free to um, use the Q&A 
or chat and put your questions in. Sarah is going to be mining those for us and, uh, and we can come uh, back together for some Q&A while we've got these fabulous panelists here. I don't wanna take up all of the time with my curiosity and questions. I wanna hear from you on the call as well. So please feel free to be populating that and we'll move on to um, getting to some of those after this next question. But um, panelists, what do you believe are gonna be our key considerations and factors for success as we focus on being resilient and rebuilding? What are those key things that we need to have top of mind? I will let you raise your hand when you have your thoughts put together so I don't target someone who's still in thought process. I don't know how to raise my hand, but I have a thought. No, I really meant like physically, Sally. This is how technology, this is how savvy I am. This is what I meant. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> so I think a key, you know, obviously the sector that Bravo represents is um, the is the cultural sector and specifically the nonprofit organizations. And I think we have something to celebrate in that we do have that like Bravo exists and that we are a publicly funded arts support organization. And I think that that's something that's innovative. I know that it's unique. Not every community around the country has that. Uh, it's certainly not going to be enough, but I think that's something to celebrate. And then think about ways that we can build on that. Think about ways that we can um, get creative with our relationships and with our funding sources so that we can um, look at things differently. So one thing specific to the art sector that I've read uh, several articles about is looking at the federal art project, which was part of the WPA when FDR was putting the New Deal together coming out of the Great Depression. There were specific funds allocated to put artists to work. If something needs to be painted or if there's an opportunity mm -hmm. for a mural at a post office or if something needs to be done, how can we specifically um, engage those workers that may have a hard time getting back into, into a job or into a, into a sector? Um, how do we make sure, you know, another idea, this is something that our community has talked a lot about is mental health. And we know there's going to be huge implications, ongoing implications on top of what we were already facing coming into this crisis. I wonder if there are creative ways for the arts organizations or for artists to be a part of coming up with innovative solutions to build that community cohesion. That's what they're good at. Mm -hmm. um, but have it be centered around some of these broader community issues that we know we're going to need to tackle. So instead of um, instead of separate from, instead of arts doing their thing over here and social services doing their things over here and public and private, how can we uniquely come together? I think that's where our resiliency is going to come from, strength in numbers and um, collaboration. But we're going to have to reframe. We're going to have to look differently. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good point. You know, that's one of our pride points, I feel. And when we talk about our secret sauce, as others come into our community and they meet with us, they, they're like, you have something special here in terms of the relationships and the coming together. It's that collaboration and collective effort and thinking differently about how to um, join those, meld them, uh, that might be a success factor for us as well. Anybody else with the physical raise? Angela? Um, we are starting to put together a, a recovery team because we think that's the next best step that we need to be starting to think about. So putting like minds together and Sally brings up a good point. The mental health piece is going to be very big in our community um, now and for quite a while, I think. Mm -hmm. And we really need to start paying attention to that. So it's not just the uh, therapist and the counselors, but really everybody in the community needs to take a uh, ownership in that, whether it's arts and culture, I think that might be a, a way for us to wrap our arms around also and for you to reach out. So I'll be in contact with you. I think you bring up a very valid point. You know, you could help us out on that. I think um, one of the best things that came out of this, if anything, was uh, telemedicine for us. Um, I hope that's here to stay because there are so many people that are reaching out on telemedicine right now um, that, you know, can't go to the clinic, especially when it comes to mental health. So 
that's something that I hope is here to stay. And um, that'll be something that we continue to bring up. It's a great thing in our community and I hope it's you know gonna stay forever. So I, I think the point is that we need to continue to be creative in not just uh, mental health, but I was on a call with uh, uh, the Convention and Visitors Bureau. You know, we have to start thinking about when we open back up and we wanna get conventions, how are we gonna be creative to get people to come and see our community. It's gonna be smaller conventions, but maybe 50 will meet in one room, 50 will come to another room, and we wanna be themes and we wanna be creative and how are we gonna get them here? So we need to be start to think about all of those things collectively so we can draw folks to our community and make sure that they feel safe and secure. Absolutely, and the arts and culture are a huge um, part of, of that draw as well. Absolutely. Yes. Yep. Jay or Elizabeth? Jay? Yeah, I think that it's a really great question. And, and I think it's important that as we're, you know, um, looking at what the ramp up of our economy looks like, it's important to understand it's, it's a stair step. Um, it's not all going to happen right at once. And, you know, we've seen, um, you know, the governor had, has had some announcements and that we're starting to see some of those stair steps. And I think it's important too that um, we look at that in terms of best practices for each of these industry sectors and we're prepared for those openings. And there's lots of components to that, right? Because we're going to not, not, um, not really a new normal, but the next normal. And, uh, you know, things are things, even though there will get, you know, economy's going to come back, it's not going to look like it did in the past. And, and what are those um, things that we need to think about as uh, all employers, whether that's private sector, public sector, nonprofit, in terms of what are those expectations moving forward with social distancing and PP, PPPs and or PPEs and, um, and uh, are we going to have to do temperature checks and all these sort of things in the short term until there is a, an inoculation? I think it's really important that um, as a community that we think about all, what all that looks like uh, industry by industry. Um, and, and then also in terms of um, sort of long term, um, again, things, things are, are, I think that it's really important for us as a region to really examine these mega trends and what are those opportunities for us, right? Um, because uh, there's already a, a number of articles out there about how um, you know, uh, regions, uh, um, mid-sized regions like uh, Greater Des Moines um, are going to be really well positioned with uh, folks who are per perhaps going to be looking for a little bit less density because density has driven some of these pandemics. I mean, those were the, a lot where the hotspots were in New York and other places where people were living on top of each other, where you had the rapid spread. Um, and, and also in terms of, you know, on the economy side, uh, what do, you know, supply chains look like? And um, are there more opportunities for reshoring and for um, logistics and 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 uh, really working with our industry clusters in terms of what are those opportunities that we can take advantage of moving forward, and then um, probably more than anything, it's all about sort of innovation and creativity, and we've just seen some incredible examples of of companies, of nonprofits, of, of governments doing uh, really deep in, digging deep in terms of innovation and and uh, really being able to um, deliver on their core products and sales and services and. Um, been in, in, in really unique ways, and, and you know, Sally mentioned that too. But but again, even in the short term, midterm, and long term, you know, innovation has always driven economies, and and um, and uh, the more innovative we are, the more successful we're going to be. So I think those are all some big themes to be thinking about. Um, but again, these are all things we're thinking about the partnership. But but all of our community needs to be embracing innovation and creativity moving forward more than we ever have before. Agreed. Before I hand off to Elizabeth, I think to Angela, even as you as you and Jay were both talking, I kept thinking, you know, this situation has put the gas pedal on making some great things happen in our community that have needed to happen. You talked about the telehealth, just easing processes related even to food delivery or um, food pickup, employment, innovation and creativity. I think, though, the equity lens is something that um, I hope um, has been heightened. Uh, to in to all of us um, throughout this situation and moving forward if we don't all have um, the lens of equity in our decision making and in the conversations I think we will not have the rebuilding and resilience that we need to have. Elizabeth I'll hand off to you. Yeah I had a couple points and the equity gap is really one that I think is going to have to be front and center as we think about what our recovery looks like. And we have too many essential workers in central Iowa that are making less than $15 an hour. 
And I think about my sister who's in an assisted living and those caregivers there um, that are, you know, coming in every day and are making $11 an hour and it's exasperated now with the pandemic. So you just think about those essential workers, but also this um, gap of technology and internet and Jay kind of highlighted that a little bit too, but it's, it's um, really becomes an equity gap um, in our community. I guess I'm proud of the fact that we um, have been able to stand up the 211 and the um, system now is, is more well known and I think it's going to be more important in our recovery efforts too because we're seeing more and more what we're calling newly needy who are calling um, 211 who have never used a food pantry, who have never um, applied for unemployment and their um, stress levels are very high. And having somebody to walk them through what's needed to get them back on the road to recovery is going to be essential. And then I think I'd also like to highlight the fact that we have a disaster recovery fund. I mean, that took two years of our community coming together to really study what does a long-term um, recovery effort look like in a community. And this fund was stood up very quickly and where it's going to be there to help us to respond to the needs that we're going to have over the next few months. So um, hats off to all of us who um, brought that together and really are thinking about long-term recovery for our community. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, and you can uh, contribute to the Disaster Recovery Fund through desmoinfoundation.org backslash disaster fund. Sarah Reichart, would you like to um, man some questions that you might be receiving? Absolutely, we do have quite a few. So Jay, what is your best recommendation to stay abreast with the latest news and status on the major events you mentioned, like the Farmer's Market and the Arts Festival? Um, we'll always have updated information on all those um, programs on our website at all times. And we're we constantly um, communicating with the media and through social media as well with any updates. Wonderful, thank you. Um, the next question, the discussion has noted several times corporate and foundational grants are on hold for the time being. I'm on the board of an organization that provides services for some of our most vulnerable families and are connected to the school system. We don't have a reserve of the 90 days of cash expenses. Um, what is the safety net for organizations like ours that are vital to healthy community yet significantly as at risk due to lack of earned and contributed revenue for the near term? We've done the CARES Act loan and it's not enough. Well, and I think fortunate to have received that, right? There are many nonprofits that weren't that fortunate. So we're sure hoping to advocate for more money coming down for nonprofit support. I don't think there's an easy um, way to wrap that up and tie a bow around it. And I don't think that a lot of foundations have paused. I think they may have pivoted in some different ways. We certainly have seen support um, into the Disaster Recovery Fund, and I know our grant-making committee um, dedicated funding to start a capacity-building grant that was just about adaptation for nonprofit organizations having to pivot uh, to serve the needs during the um, response to COVID. Um, Angela, I know you mentioned that you're pausing some things, but you have provided significant funding related to issues um, uh, related to the social distancing needed for those that in our homeless population, as well as um, child care services for the those that are serving in our jails, for example. So there have been ways that you've had to pivot your funding, your funding to have emer you know really emergent um, response to community needs. Um, Sally, I don't and know if you have services. We're trying to provide some. Yeah, I don't really have. Um... I know all, most of the nonprofits are, you know, in the same boat that he's or she's talking about as far as, uh, you know, needing funds for uh, their operations. And we right now, as I mentioned, are taking a pause on all of that. But um, we have pivoted our dollars on other things until we really are helping people with basic needs. If they're, you know, looking for uh, extra rent assistance or clothing or food assistance, we have stepped up our dollars on that or shelter. Um, the refugees, we have small mini grants uh, ran out of the general assistance program for that. You know, we've put money in the disaster fund, but really right now until we know exactly where we stand, we're, we're putting a pause. And Mm -hmm. As everyone knows, Prairie Meadows is closed, and that's where we get a lot of our extra dollars for the um, 
grants and sponsorships. And Sally, I know you've been responsive in actually getting money out faster to the organizations that you um, grant to. Yeah, Bravo's a little unique in that we do um, general operating support. The, ma the majority of our funds are already general operating support grants. Um, so very flexible, trust-based, um, letting the organization spend it the way they need it. And we were able to, um, after we were running our financial models, we were able to commit to being able to honor 100% of our existing grant commitments, even though we don't have that money in the door yet. We were able to honor 100% of our grant commitments and we were able to accelerate payments on those grants. So we, in the last five weeks, have been able to put $1.5 million into the cultural sector, um, which is amazing. To the question on the table though, I was on a call uh, last week with representatives from the National Endowment from the Arts and um, Americans for the Arts. I don't know if the nonprofit that you're talking about is a, a cultural organization, but the bottom line is the, there's never gonna be enough money. And what we need to embrace, and I know that's not a positive, a positive thought, but what we need to embrace right now is this, this time that we have to pivot to the next normal. I really like what Jay said. It's not a new normal. It's not, it's, it's the next normal. And every nonprofit needs to be thinking about how they can adjust and modify and reframe and, um, reconsider and I know there are a lot of resources through the Community Foundation. Jay talked about all the webinars and all the small business support. There are lots of resources out there. Um, if, if this organization needs connection, have them reach out to me even if they're not an arts organization and we can try and make those connections for them so that they can be learning from best practices. But 100% of our nonprofits are going to have to pivot, 100% of them. Mm -hmm. And we are, I mean, we continue to look at best practices across the country to see are there things that we can bring in here in terms of bridge loans for nonprofits and things like that. So we're actively looking into those kinds of things as well. If there's, if there's not another response to that, I wonder, I think that we do, do you think we have time for one more, Sarah, or do you think we need to move on to a final? I think so. I see Jay is wanting to tag in on that question, though. Good. Jay, you're gonna have to yeah, just real quick. I think those are all really great piece of advice, and 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 um, it's it's a huge issue out there with nonprofits. And you know, I think that those of us on the call right now, a number of us are nonprofits as well, so we're all sort of having these same sort of internal discussions. Um, but but I think that you know what I told our team too. I said, look, you know, there's some things we can control right now. There's some things we can't control. But one of the things we can definitely control is how do we pivot and create as high value as we can right now to help address this current situation. And um, what can we do to help as many people as we can? What can we do to help our investors? What can we do to help our members? What can we do to help the community? And, uh, and, and uh, really make those pivots in terms of what we do right now um, in the short term, midterm, and long term. So I think that that's one piece of advice, I think, for, for all nonprofits. And Sally sort of mentioned that for the next normal. But I think about, think about it right now, too. Um, as these, there's tough decision makings for funders, but if they see your nonprofit is providing significant value for helping the community get through this right now, you're going to be a lot better positioned for securing those short-term dollars as well, too. And I know that's easier said than done, um, but but really, again, dig deep with that innovation and creativity. And what value um, can you do to help, um, even if it's not something that you've done before, but what can you do to help get this community through the next month or two? And um, that will stand out in terms of uh, long-term, in terms of um, your donor base and, and, and your long-term longevity and those, and those pivots moving forward. Thanks for that. One final question, and I'll just ask for a sentence or two from each of you, um, just so we can honor our time commitment here. But what's one thing that philanthropy can do to support our community's recovery? Sally, I know you've got an answer to this. So I think that the, the request, the ask I would make is to We've talked a lot about what's happening in the moment, what's happening right now. I think philanthropy needs to respect the very long tail that this is going to have and that certain organizations and entities and businesses and industries are going to be able to come back and they're going to be able to pivot quickly and others are not. And um, that equity comment, Christy, that you made, making sure that we're thinking through how everyone is affected. Um, but this is going to have long-term implications. And so um, as you opened the meeting with it's a marathon, not a sprint, I think our donors and our philanthropic community needs to maintain that attitude as well. 
Thank you very much. Elizabeth? Yeah, I guess I would continue that thought about it's a marathon, but also um, that donors and foundations and others can really wrap their arms around um, the nonprofit sector right now. Maybe it's not money, maybe it's advice. Um, it's just, it's a very isolating time. And there's so many people in our community that are so innovative and so helpful. If they could just be willing to advise and support um, the sector, it's gonna really pay off in the end. That's great, great thought. Thank you. Angela, you're unmuted. Would you like to go next? What's one thing philanthropy can do to support our recovery? Um, I, I think they need to participate in uh, part of the recovery group and really focus on our physical, mental, and financial health of our community because I think it's all wrapped together because there are so many needs financially, the mental, and the physical health of our community. And somehow we got to get our arms around that. We can't do everything at once. This is a long term. Uh, issue that we're going to have for a while and I think we just need to be really methodical on how we're going to do this together and mm -hmm. it's really all three of those things it's financial it's mental health and it's the physical piece of our community so we really have to be thoughtful on how we're going to do this and I think it's going to take a bunch of us sitting down to work this out mm -hmm. and I, I'm hoping that we as donors in philanthropies we all do this together because it's not just one sector that's going to do it. You know, it's the nonprofits, it's the arts and culture, it's the Jays of the world. It, it's everyone putting this together. Yeah, it really is. Thank you. Jay? Yeah, I think, you know, Chrissy, you know, you talk about the secret sauce and, you know, sort of when I talk about the secret sauce, it's really, um, that hasn't changed, right? It's, it's the regionalism it's public private partnerships, it's the leadership and it's the vision. And quite frankly, um, those four things, which we've historically um, been really good at, those have never been, they will never be more important than they are moving forward with what we need to do um, and design those, um, those, those strategies and, and nonprofits are a big part of all of that. Um, so I think that, you know, I think we need to, you know, lean on our, our past um, and lean into the future with, with those and, you know, through those frameworks that we have through um, these frameworks of Capital Crossroads and others where we ha have got those existing relationships and, and we know how to do this and when times maybe we're a little bit better. Um, but, but we have those relationships, we know how to do it. Um, we just need to, um, again, we need to make those pivots and, and focus and, and execute. And that's what we do and that's what we'll do on this one. And I'm confident that um, we will assess that situation um, and uh, come up with a plan and continue to um, be a best in class region and set ourselves apart like we've always done. Thank you, perfect. Thank you panelists um, and friends for coming together. It's great to see you just so our audience knows we've been coming together at least weekly um, just to, to share about what's going on and continue to support each other and, and keep our arms around each other. Um, thank you for joining today. I do just have a final, Tom, if you could go to the final slide, please. And maybe it's there and I just can't see it. But please don't forget about um, GiveDSM. So GiveDSM.org is our online platform where nonprofit organizations are actively populating their funding needs. And we have added, uh, donors can go on there and search by areas of interest. And we have added an interest area, COVID-19. So nonprofits who are specifically needing funding to deal with COVID-19 issues are on GiveDSM.org. But so are other funding needs. And um, I would just say as well, let's not wait until the end of the year to do our giving this year. We always hear about year-end giving. Let's get to give GSM right now, or even better yet, on Giving Tuesday now, which is Tuesday, May 5th. This is a national effort to get people to focus on giving back. We will be celebrating and pushing hard on Giving Tuesday now, which is next Tuesday, May 5th which is also the date of our next Donor Connect, where we will uh, be discussing inspiring resilience in our uh, nonprofit sector. So there were lots of questions related to that today. So that tells me that you're gonna wanna make sure to get to our website and sign up for that Donor Connect as well. And as Elizabeth mentioned, we've all partnered on this disaster recovery fund. And um, gosh, to date, I think there has been 
just short of maybe $850,000 raised into that fund. This week, I know that WHO Channel 13 has started their 13 days of giving that will also see us through Giving Tuesday now to just um, drive our community to that fund. There have already been investments made out of that fund to things such as um, the need for food, for things like uh, the need for legal aid in our community by those most vulnerable, for things like translating crucial information to keep people safe into languages that people um, in our community read and understand. And also, um, there have been some collaborations of organiza organizations serving those who are undocumented or underdocumented in our um, community who are very vulnerable right now, and that will get case management and support directly to those individuals and families. So there is good, good stuff happening out of that fund and important investments being made from that fund. So appreciate everyone who's partnered or given to that. In closing, another phrase you hear from the community foundation is that we believe we are simply better together. We're better when we plan together, we're better when we work together, and we are most certainly better when we give together. This better together spirit is the culture we imagine and strive to live through our work, play, and resilience in Greater Des Moines. Never has this mantra been more relevant. Thank you for joining today and for coming together to inspire resilience and rebuilding in the community we love. Continue to take good care and be in touch as we can be a resource. Thank you. Thank you, panelists.